I'm making this video basically the video response to a couple short videos out there. Log Cabin Looms has one and the Gun Geek has another. What to look for when you're buying a Mosin and Nagant. And even though I'm working with the Mosin Nagants, um, you can apply this to any surplus rifle or any gun that you buy. Rifle that you buy. <clears throat> um, the advice these guys are giving you and a lot of advice out there, uh, I'm not going to say it's wrong or without some truth based into it, but the reason I have all these guns and the reason I buy numerous guns is A, they're affordable, so I can afford to have 15, 20 of the damn things without going bankrupt. Uh, you can't do that with AR-15s or, you know, some guns. <clears throat> and what my goal is, is to take measurements and present facts. Facts that I will prove to you. Okay, not something I heard, not something that I read in a book. I have actual guns and I take real precise measurements. Now what I'm doing goes beyond the skill of most people. I've been a machinist for over 30 years, okay? <clears throat> I'm used to working with real, real tight tolerances, tighter than what are in these guns. And I know how to measure things. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to measure these bores. And I'm going to take it a step further. Uh, usually, to measure a bore, you slug the bore, you drive a little hunk of lead sinker or something down there, you go down the barrel, take it out. You know, I have several of them. I have a video on how to do it. And what you do is you end up with a you know, little lead plug. Let this get into focus if it will. Where am I? Ah. There. You got a little lead plug, which what it does, it rides down the barrel and measures what is called the groove diameter. Now what the groove diameter is, is a bar rifle barrel is basically a tube. You have a hole, and then they take what it's called, there's different types of rifling, but we'll go with a simple one, a brooch. A brooch is a cutter, and what it does, it'll cut anywhere from four, six, two grooves, depending on the tool. Cuts grooves in the barrel. Now, the cutter is made in a like at an angle, so as it goes, it turns. Because uh, whenever you hear one turn in ten and a half inches, it's kind of like a screw. All right, how it works is say you got a quarter inch, twenty screw, twenty uh, threads per inch. If you take a quarter inch, twenty screw and stick it in something and rotate it twenty times, complete times, that screw should travel one inch in to a piece, okay? Screws are used to clamp and hold, so the twist is much faster. A rifle bullet, same principle as a screw, but the twist is elongated. So like a 30 caliber rifle, it's usually one twist in 10 inches. So as that bullet travels 10 inches down the barrel on that groove, it will completely rotate once as it travels 10 inches in the barrel length. This just gives it a mild spin to stabilize the bullet. You don't want it going like a quarter inch 20 screw and turning 20 times completely over because then it'll just flip out of the barrel, you know. Uh, that's what rifling does and that's the concept then. It's, it's machined into the tube and it cuts. Now, when you're looking and another thing, these guys are telling you, well, you know, what, what Log Cabin Looms was doing, and what we're going to do here with more proceedings, he took a bullet, this is just a bullet, he had a light round, he sticks it in a barrel, and what he's trying to do is make a quick, on-the-fly measurement 
of getting a different, bigger bore diameter. And what he's checking here is not the groove diameter, he's checking the bore diameter. What the bore diameter is, is the hole that's first drilled through the barrel, okay? And your groove diameter should kind of match the diameter of the bullet. And once you cut the grooves in there, how it works is, in the chamber, the cartridge is seated, and the throat of the chamber will match the groove diameter. And then the bullet's more or less resting in the throat on the groove diameter. When the cartridge goes off, it drives the bullet forward. The bore diameter, which is the smaller one, which the groove diameter is larger, and cut into the bore. And what happens is that rifling bites into the bullet jacket and gives it its spin. Okay, that's, that's how basically a rifle firearm works. So you have two diameters, the small one which is the bore and the larger one which is the groove diameter which is cut into the bore diameter. And this is what your bullet basically rides along your groove diameter. And your bore diameter centers the bullet, bites into it and gives it its spin. So when you slug a barrel, like I showed you that slug, what you're measuring is you're measuring the depth of the groove diameter. Where this is important when you're reloading is you want your bullet kind of close to that. If your groove diameter is two or three thousandths bigger than the diameter of the bullet, then when the bullet travels down the barrel it has room to, to move to be unstable and your accuracy won't be that great. Plus the gas will blow by the bullet, you know, when there's space there. Generally how they load ammo, and we'll go over the specs, is you want your bullet, the way they make it for safety reasons, is the bullet diameter will be 1,000 smaller than the groove diameter. Okay? I've mic'd up some bullets, some surplus bullets, to compare to these diameters and give you an idea of what's going on. <clears throat> and uh, in reality, you know, people got to remember these are surplus guns. They were some of them were mass produced during the war in, in emergency situations. Tolerances were loosened up to speed up production. Uh, it was a national emergency. They're not made like sporting guns. You know, when you go and lay down the money for a brand new sporting gun from Remington, Winchester, or Browning, you're paying for a commercially produced product with tight specifications made for, you know, specifically for sporting use. And military guns aren't made that way, okay? And then after the war, they're used. How much use did they get? You know, and then what is done with them afterwards? Uh, a lot of these people will collect these Nagants and that, all of them have been reworked. So none of them are really in their original condition. I guess they disassemble these guns. I've seen stuff that, you know, you have some tool of bolt parts with some Jvansk uh, tool part or bolt parts because they used to stamp the little, their little uh, arsenal marking like on the bolt head, the body, and the cocking knob. So. Really, in a way, when you're looking at it, you got a barrel marking. They've all been reworked, re-serial numbered to be matching. You know, it's hard to find mismatched ones unless you got the early batches. And uh, what I want to do is try to tell you that, you know, the information these guys have given you, there's some truth to it, but then again, when you get down really technically, there's not. There are variables in the manufacturing and that, and uh, really it's kind of luck of the draw. The guns aren't expensive, you buy it, you shoot it, whatever. Some people are only going to buy surplus ammo, they're not going to buy reloadable, they're not going to reload or nothing. The whole idea is the gun's inexpensive, the ammo's inexpensive, I shoot it, have fun with it, and you know, once it, it's not like that anymore where there's no surplus ammo and it's expensive, probably really not interested in it, so. Now, let's recap. So we understand that the bore diameter is a small hole, the groove diameter is what they cut out, 
and the bullet rides on the groove diameter. And that's when you slug the barrel, that's what you measure. This is also depends on your accuracy. Okay? Uh, the closer the bullet is to the groove diameter, the thousands or so, actually if it's the same thing your accuracy will, will pick up. But the reason the ammunition manufacturers don't make the ammo like that is because of lawsuits and you have no control over the quality or what, you know, there's so many different guns from so many sources. Uh, this is an old cartridge. This gun, this cartridge has been around over a hundred years. So when you're manufacturing commercial ammo, you have to more or less kind of keep things to where you're safe. You're not going to be liable because you have no control over what's chambered for this. When you hand load, you can tweak these bullets up. I like to get the bullet the same diameter as the groove diameter, and I found the accuracies on these old guns are a hell of a lot better. But sometimes the groove diameter is going to be out of spec. So let's go into the exact specification. I'll show you how I made a bore diameter measurement and comparing to the slugs, I had the specifications for this rifle barrel. And uh, I'm going to show you the specs, then I'm going to show you how I did a real precision measurement on these bores and using the slugs also how I know exactly what they are. Now once I determine this, I'll keep a list and then I, you know, also make measurements to the ammunition, which the diameter of the bullet, this and that. Then I'll see the performance. And you know, we can compare one gun to the other with the same ammo and see how these variances or these variables affect the rifle's accuracy and function. You know, is it something that affects it greatly? Is it something that affects it in a way where really going through all this trouble is a waste of time, you know? But, I will have the proof, I'll show you, and it will be exact, and then you can take my information and my time in doing this and come up with your own conclusion. And basically cut through all the bullshit and conjecture and, you know, I heard this, I heard that, you know. We know. We're going to prove it out and know. So I'm going to get the camera moved around, I'm going to go over specifications, I'm going to tell you how I've been making my measurements and how we're going to progress and as we go on in testing, prove out this stuff.